I'm going to discuss two models which are very uh, close one to the other, the easy and the tricritical easy model, and moreover, uh, elaborating uh, about theory versus experiments. So I would like to start with a famous sentence by Richard Feynman that uh, as uh, also Fermi would say, bring our, uh, how to say, mental insanity of a <coughs> theoretical physicist ground to earth, and remind us that no matter how beautiful our theories might be, at the end of the day, the acid test of them is really matching with uh, experiments. Now, in recent year, there has been actually a stunning uh, and I would say delightful uh, matching uh, between uh, beautiful theoretical and experimental work in the field of uh, integrable field theory and experimental realization, mostly in terms of quantum chains. Now, uh, a remarkable example of this is the two-dimensional easy model in a magnetic field, uh, and in particular, its underlying E8 structures. Now, as you probably know, uh, this theory was set forward by, Alyosha, uh, by Sasha Zamologikov in the late 90s and opened up a beautiful uh, new scenario how to deal with statistical physics nearby the critical point, <laughs> namely in terms of scattering of the quasi-particle excitations. So in this, uh, in this paper, uh, Sasha Zamologico proposed this on-shell theory, the S-matrix, but to compare with experiment, you need off-shell theory. You need off-shell quantities. You need correlation functions. Now, this uh, program for the easy model in a magnetic field was carried out in a paper with uh, Gesualdo Delfino. And uh, uh, let me just remind the broad uh, uh, data of the scattering theory. Uh, the scattering theory predicts that there are eight uh, masses with a precise and exact mass ratio given here that can be associated uniquely to the Cartan matrices of E8, moreover with association which has very uh, suggestive probabilistic interpretation, namely the lowest mass is associated to the lowest node that you can reach by Brownian motion, the second mass is here, the second node that you can reach by Brownian motion, and so on and so forth. Now notice that this theory has a very peculiar features, namely that uh, uh, five of these uh, excitations are above the continuum. So typically you are expect not to see them in any experiment because they are hidden in the continuum uh, contribution coming from the multi-particle states, in particular by the two particle or the lowest one. However, we'll see that the story is uh, more interesting than that. So um, I'm puzzled what are these masses? So. Is, is this somehow connected with, with the gaps between yes. excitations? Or? Exactly, exactly. Now, I'm not going to discuss in detail here the theory, because uh, this was just a flash, if you want, because I'm going to do for the tricritical is more than in full details, so you will find the full uh, answer to your question later. But just to anticipate it, if you look the easy model nearby the critical point, so everything, the correlation length is infinite. However, when you perturb by a magnetic field, you create a gap, which is uh, precisely the uh, measure, if you want, uh, magnetic field associated to the first masses, if you want, is of course non-analytic, okay? Now, the genius of Sasha Zamologico was to understand that these quasi-particle excitations can make scattering and the relative scattering might create bound states. And these bound states proliferate. And looking all the amplitude, at the end of the day, can close what is called a bootstrap program exactly with eight particles. However, I will be more precise later with this statement. But this is about. So you have to imagine the easy model nearby the fixed point perturbed by a magnetic field to be an ensemble of particles which are scattered elastically around. Okay. But does it mean if I look at the correlation function, 
it's decaying exponentially, and I look at these, ah, these are the exponential yeah, yeah. coefficients. Let me, let me just go through. Exactly. So you are looking in X. However, what people have done, so uh, starting from uh, the first group in, uh, in Oxford some times ago by Alan Tennant, Coldea, and so on and so forth, was to realize spin chain materials that are able to in certain regime, of course, of the parameter to simulate this class of universality. So this was the first uh, paper on science. And uh, more uh, recently, uh, my collaborators in uh, Shanghai were able really to grow up this crystal with high precision and make scattering experiments, which however probe the correlation function in momentum because it's easier. And so, this is the stunning result. So the curve is the theory coming from my paper with Delfino. So when we sum up the spectral function, and these are the experimental dots that they realize just making neutron scattering on this material. So the theory is just one, there's one parameter which sets the scale or something. Like that. Exactly. No parameter except the mass gap. No fit. No fit whatsoever. Okay? Okay, now, this has, uh, of course, certain features. I'm not going in detail because I'm going to take once again back this in other. But you see, you can distinguish peak, which are related really to individual particles, which are, of course, merged in this ocean of the continuum. But still, since the contribution to the spectral function is high, so this emerge as a peak in these things. Are there resonances? Are there resonances? Well, strictly speaking, the, the one particle are delta function contribution. However, since this experiment are done on a crystal, so the momentum is also modulus g in that, in, the, in that figure there are also some peaks related to the periodicity of the momentum. You have also to consider some broadening of these resonances. And the rule of thumb is that you broaden the resonance essentially with the square root of the height. So this is the rule of thumb. And this is much perfectly the, the data. Okay, now this was just uh, an appetizer. So what I want to say is that, if possible, there is a class of universality even richer and more intriguing than what I just sketched, what I just presented. This is the one relative to the three critical easy model. Why so? Because this model, as you will see, is the place where beautiful symmetry emerge at the same time. So we have E7 instead of E8, we have supersymmetry, we have duality, we have parity, etc., etc. So at once we have a really a theoretical jewel we can play with and we can test many of these just going in the right direction away from criticality. So, and moreover, I will pause at the end a very interesting and engaging challenge from the experimental point of view. What I mean is, it's very relatively easy to set up nowadays a system which concerns with spin one half. Because the interaction is very simple with spin one half, you cannot do much. But if you have spin one, and then you want to tune the interaction properly in a very, we say, crystal field, this is really a challenge. And so far, I talked to many leading experimentalists like Oldea in Oxford. They are still unable really to reproduce in detail these things, although they have some alternative idea. So here there is really an open problem, how to uh, check the prediction I'm going to present to you in really lab. So, uh, so I'm going to describe briefly this class of universal, the tricritical easy model which, as you know, is related to spin one and the so-called bloom couple model. I'm going to tell you the conformal field theory and the deformation which make emerge all these symmetries. I will briefly discuss the supersymmetry and the E7. Then I focus my attention only on one of them, namely I'm going to explore, just for, uh, to say, uh, time permitting, the thermal deformation which is the one actually which uh, give rise to these E7 particles, which however can be particle or solitons, depending in which, uh, uh, la in which uh, side of the, of the phase you are, namely low or high temperature. 
Then I'm going to describe how you can compute exactly the matrix element of the operator and therefore reconstructing exactly the correlation function that can be later on compared with experiments. Okay, so this is, I'm talking physics one, which has uh, uh, more than spin one and minus one, which is say easing, also that zero. And then zero can be associated to the fact that the site is not occupied. So this can be realized indeed as a quantum chain. So you see there are, uh, say, these bizarre fields that is not easy to do experimentally, if you want to spin one. Okay, and then there are other interactions I neglected here. Now, uh, in order to describe in an easier pedagogical way what I'm talking about, it's easier to adopt the two-dimensional classical picture of the model. So what is about? Consists of a lattice, let's say square lattice, but you can take any lattice you want, where there are variables which are plus and minus one, which are the spin, if you want, and variable t, which are uh, uh, whose value is 0, 1, which tell us simply if the site i is occupied or not. Okay? And now, with these variables, you can write down the most general Hamiltonian that is local, so the most local you can have, so next neighborhood. And this consists of four parameters. So these will be the four relevant fields that dictate all the dynamics of this system. So there are two even uh, couplings which concern the variable SISJ as far as the site I and J are occupied. So these are easing-like, however, it's correct by the presence of T. The chemical potential which rule how many sites are occupied. So moving delta, we can occupy or deplete the lattice. And then there are some leading magnetic field, but also some sub-leading magnetic field. So the operator content of this model is richer than the easy model. Okay, now the phase diagram of the tricritical easy model, you can work it out, has been worked out in the past, let's say numerically or with other arguments. And uh, what do you say? Well, first of all, to get uh, criticality, you have to switch off to zero the magnetic field. So I've done this, and I remain in the plane of delta and j. So in this plane, there is a first order phase transition line, on which I will come back later in great detail, which meets a second order phase transition line on a point. By definition, this is called three critical point. Okay? Now, the, this uh, uh, curve separated low temperature from high temperature phase of the model. It's very interesting to understand what is the ending point of the second order phase transition line. Because if you move here away, means there are no gap. And what are the large distance of this system? Well, the large distance of this system will be the easy model. Here I'm going to give you the, really the pedagogical way to see that. Later I'm going to give you the most refined reason why easing has to be there. So the pedagogical way is uh, imagine I'm at the, at the critical point and I start varying the chemical potential. But when I do this, I create a correlation length. But I can tune the temperature to disorder once again the system. And I can keep going. Uh, filling the lattice, screwing the temperature. Filling the lattice, increasing the temperature. So remaining always critical. And at the end of the day, what I have? Completely filled lattice with variable one and plus and minus, which are critical. What it is? Critical easing. Okay? So this is the simplest argument how to understand that the second order line has to arrive to the easy model. It's very interesting to understand from which direction it's coming. And by the way, it's coming what is called uh, nowadays TT bar. Namely, it's coming from the family of the identity. And this opens up a beautiful uh, subject in itself. Now, uh, I have now to open up a bit of the perspective in order to understand better all the dynamics of this model, uh, referring uh, to the famous uh, 
a, seminar, a seminal work by Belavin Polygon Zamologikov, which taught us how to think field theories. So we have to think as a set of uh, fields, local, which depend by coupling constant according to certain group, and vary in the scale, they move around and reach sometimes some critical point. Now this, uh, uh, the minimal uh, way of doing that is the so-called minimal models, whose lowest uh, uh, models are indeed the easing, the trick critical easing. Now the work of Belami in Polygozamologikov tell us also a way to characterize the operator content of the theory. In what sense? Well, you focus the attention on the stress energy tensor. They satisfy uh, uh, operator pro expansion where appear a parameter C. Then you can convert this uh, uh, algebraic uh, expression uh, in terms of an algebra, simply introducing the mode of the field T. So this convert the problem essentially how to understand all possible rotation property of a body in terms of SU2 irreducible representation. So what you have to do is a very conceptual, you have reached a very conceptual point that in order to understand all criticality, you have to understand the irreducible representation of this algebra characterized by a parameter. And uh, C identify the class universality and the irreducible representation and the primary operator are those which uh, fulfill this algebraic equation. The eigenvalues here are the exact conformal dimension and anomalous dimension of the fields. So if I do this program for the tricritical easing model, what I got is the following. I got a table of anomalous dimension that are organized in this way because there are very nice uh, uh, properties associated with reducible representations. The central charge is 7 tenth. This is called Katz table. But to reconstruct the physical fields, as you probably know, you should take the left and right hand side of this algebra because there are two copies and combine themselves. So if I take uh, the field which has right and left anomalous dimension 380, this will be associated to the leading magnetization. If I take 110, 110, this will be the energy density. The subleading magnetization will be associated to 716, 716, and the density operator, 3 half, 3 half. Obviously, in any algebra, there should be the identity, and then there is an irrelevant operator. But notice there are some chiral fields, which are fermions. The way of uh, uh, understanding this fermion is that the difference between left and right uh, uh, conformal dimension is a spin. So here, these are scalar fields because the difference is zero. But here, this is spin 3 half, and this is spin 3 half minus 3 half, if you want. This is spin 1 half. So this is uh, honest fermions, however, interacting. What do you mean interacting? Are these fields in the partition function of the pre-critical easing group? Depending, uh, depending on the boundary condition, depending what you do. So if you put periodic boundary condition, there are no fermions. They are only the scalars. If you put anti-periodic, you see the fermions, for instance. Okay, so depend very much on the, on the. Okay, so. Okay, now once you have the field, you can work it out the operator pro expansion, namely looking the leading singularity. I'm skipping here the trivial uh, uh, x dependence, and uh, so the epsilon field close to epsilon, sorry, close to t. T, T close to T, and so on and so forth. You can work it out, all this. And of course, the fact is interacting come up from the highly non-trivial values of the structure constant, which involve gamma function. Now, notice one uh, magic thing of the model. The fact that this uh, structure constant associated to the fusion rule of epsilon, epsilon, and T, T is exactly the same. Never happened in any other model, never. But in this case, they are exactly the same. Or would you repeat that? I didn't. Yeah. So you work it out, the operator pro expansion are a bunch of constant, which come from uh, duality of the four-point correlation and residue of it. Now, if you work it out this for any other minimal, infinitely many, you never find that the field one, two, 
One, two is the one which sit here. So I'm using the notation you see here. One, two, one, two. And the field at one, three. Never happened that uh, these fields share the same structure constant. Never. Okay? So when you see this, you understand that something is going on really in this model. Okay? So I will come back in a minute to this. Now, I would like to dig a little bit uh, on the duality of this model and the possibility to have order and disorder operators. So this, as you know, is a mapping that exists between low and high temperature of the models, worked out, I mean, pointed out by Kramer so one year in 1941, and uh, the frolic uh, discussing very detail later and, uh, and open up a new way of looking at that. Now, in the tricritical easing, each order operator will be accompanied by a dual operator tau of equal conformal dimension. So this is the statement. And the reason is that, uh, as in easing model, this is a simple consequence of the presence of fermionic fields. In easing are free fields. Here are not free. But the, the logic is exactly the same. So how to show this? Now, let me consider the field G which has a dimension 3 half, 0, 3 half, 0, and make the operator pro expansion. Now, what happened? This is a field 3 half. We have field 3 half. This has dimension 3. is odd because it's a fermion, so can only have odd power. And obviously, the only way you can have here is a field of dimension 2, which is a stress energy tensor. There is no way out. So when you convert this in mode expansion, the mode expansion being a fermionic fields can be periodic or antiperiodic, depending if you want to put a branch cut or not in the origin. And this gives rise to a super uh, symmetric algebra. And uh, you can repeat the same program. Namely, you can look at the tricritical easing model as irreducible representation of a bigger algebra, which is a supersymmetry. And you know supersymmetry is uh, uh, irreducible representation, which are Nevoschwarz, which are completely local, and in this case are made of the density operator, the fermions, the companion of the fermion, and T. So this means then when I'm going to look the operator pro expansion phi with itself in the framework supersymmetry, of course they share the same structure constant, because they are part of the same multiplets. Okay, come from algebra, nothing else. Come from this beautiful structure behind. And then there are the Ramon sector when the fields are no local each other. Now you see G0 square close to L0. So the fact that the eigenvalues of L0 is never in this theory equal to C over 24 imply that G, when he apply to any fields, should have a companion and vice versa. So the presence of zero mode of fermions necessarily imply that all order parameter is associated to a dual disorder and vice versa. Okay? Okay, so now, so far I've been uh, digging about the Z2 symmetries of this model. So the, the spin and the Kramer duality. Now let me move on and let me illustrate it, the, the hidden symmetries of this model, which concern, uh, so supersymmetry I just said, with the others one, so in particular E7. Now, the most general way of constructing conformal field theory is uh, through coset construction. Coset construction means that you identify a group, write it down, Vesumino with a model on it, and then start multiplying it and decomposing. So if you do so, uh, you can use SU2 as a group. And if you make this uh, coset construction of SU2, you are going to recover tricritical easy model. <coughs> but you can use also E7. This coset construction provides exactly the easy model, the tricritical easy model as well. While the supersymmetry just uh, presented can be seen as a coset in this other way. Now, I'm going to use uh, this SU2 construction to illustrate in a very simple way what is about, what is this model about. 
So this uh, Cosette construction identify the relevant fields of my model as a normal order of some uh, uh, fundamental fields. So the sigma will be the magnetization, the epsilon will be the phi square normal order, sigma 3 odd phi cube, and t phi 4. And therefore, you can write it down, the most general Lagrangian, with these uh, fields with uh, maximum power phi 6. Now, of course, you have to take in with grain of salt this Lagrangian. Namely, it is uh, beautiful uh, to make all the bookkeeping or symmetry to understand what's going on qualitatively and so on. To make it work quantitatively is another story. <coughs> but uh, uh, at the level of keeping track, what is going on is very simple. So let me tell you what is going on is now summary of a long years of study of this model. So if I take the uh, tricriticalism model where all the coupling constants are zero but phi six, I'm going to perturb by a magnetic field. As a matter of fact, is the only one deformation which is not integrable. Okay. So you have just a bunch of particles which scatter inelastically. Now, if you take uh, the G2 and you switch to positive value, you're going to have the high temperature phase of the model. While if you take uh, negative, you are going to have the low temperature phase of the model, which will be the integrable E7 I'm going to discuss in great detail later. Interestingly enough, if you take the G3, the subleading magnetization, this also provides an integrable model with a very interesting situation of asymmetric kinks and corresponding bound states. And finally, the G4 deformation give rise, if it's positive, to massless particle. If it's negative, to uh, kinks. And this is the supersymmetry one. Now, this provides, uh, as a matter of fact, the most uh, refined way of understanding the easing uh, model. Because if I take the the formation of this model with G4, which corresponds to this one, I'm essentially on the broken supersymmetry line. And you know, when a supersymmetry is broken, should have Goldstino. But Goldstino are Majorana fermions. And therefore, the lowest and long range dynamics of this theory has to be described by Majorana fermions which are just easy. Is it spontaneous or spontaneous? Spontaneous. 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 So this is uh, actually, I could put as a joke, if easing was not discovered, you should introduce necessarily, because it's the relic of a broken supersymmetry. OK? OK, so. Uh, in this yeah. broken phase, both Excitation, the other super symmetry, fermionic and bosonic, they do exist? Yeah, but uh, the point is, uh, no, no, I, the point is, uh, when you have uh, this pattern, when you go away, there are still bosonic particles massive, mm -hmm. which, however, at a certain point start to, the mass start to become higher and higher. And since you have massless degrees of freedom, they are going to win in the long range. So there are still massive excitations but they are broken, so you have no matching of masses, okay? And so the muscle are just uh, the Majorana fermions of easing. So to put uh, uh, in detail what I did, in the line of G2 and G4, the coupling of the phi4 and phi... Majorana, they are not at the ends, so it's kind of, they are dynamical fields? Yeah, they are dynamical fields, they are uh, fermions. They are fermions, and if you want, the action in the low in the, in the larger distance is like easing perturbed by psi, de psi, de bar, psi, de psi. So it's a quartic interaction, which is the TT bar I was mentioning before. Yeah. So uh, this, uh, along the vertical line, I have the supersymmetry, which is either exact or spontaneously broken. Now, when I, I move the parameter, I want you to notice how beautifully the theory reset himself. So I start with a bunch of three states, three vacua, which are the uh, first order line. If I add temperature, I'm going to have a false vacuum decay of this form. And when I start moving, I will completely kill this false vacuum and write to a symmetric situation. 
If I keep moving the coupling, this becomes flattened and flattened, and then I arrive to, to the spontaneous symmetry breaking supersymmetry, so flatten uh, vacua. If I keep moving uh, temperature, I start creating new vacua, and uh, going there, you will have this. So it's a very interesting problem to understand how the spectral the theory evolve if you move this coupling. Because you start from kinks, kink create bound states and false vacuum decay, one stable vacua with masses, then lowest masses, zero masses, and keep going like this. And moreover, we know that all this has to be related by duality. Whatever you find in one language, you should find in the other, okay? So today, so this problem can be carried out actually, can be carried out. I have no time to discuss in detail. So today I'm going to describe only the E7 uh, perturbation that in the high temperature phase is a pure uh, symmetric vacua with excitations which are particle. In the low temperature phases, there are uh, particle and kinks. And this is the E7 structure of the model. So repeating. I'm at the tricritical point. I perturb with uh, temperature, so I move away from temperature. This will uh, display the E7 symmetry. This is what is expected. Can you explain a bit better what you mean by symmetry? Yeah. Thanks for the question because it's, uh, it's an abuse of language. It's, uh, thanks. As a matter of fact, also in easy model, E8 is not a symmetry. There is no symmetry whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the spectrum resemble parameter data eh, which come from E7. The technical uh, word is, uh, you can write down a Lagrangian, which is Toda field theory, where the interaction is made in terms of exponential, which involves the simply laced root of E7 or E8. But there are no symmetry, except the automorphism of the algebra. Okay, but there is no symmetry, thanks. So it's an abuse of language, strictly speaking. So indeed, uh, if you take E7 and then I add the extra mass to make mass less, I have the standing linking diagram of E8, which indeed has a symmetry, automorphism, which is Z2. So I should expect particle to be labeled by some kind of Z2 symmetry with respect to the group. But this is the only one. Okay. Okay, the theory is integrable. And as a matter of fact, the exact S-matrix was worked out years ago together with Christe on the following uh, fact. We can check explicitly that there are conservation law which has a very peculiar set of spin. Now, you easily recognize that these are the Coxter exponent of E7. The rule is if you start doing a pairwise sum of these numbers, always turns out to be 18. Any numbers which has this property is a Coxter set, okay? In this case, E7. At this point, on the basis of this spin, you can make a very educated guess what the dynamics can be. So you can argue like this. This particle, this system should have a fundamental particle. Let me say it's odd. I have a Z2 symmetry too. At this point, knowing the spin which are conserved, I can pose the fact that the fundamental particle create a bound state which I call A2 but in this case, there is also a possibility to create another one. This comes from the conservation law themselves. It's a long story to explain the technicality, but this is the... But not only this, since conservation law means whatever is here as value should be here, you can impose the conservation, this quality. At the end of the day, I can predict uniquely the mass ratio of this. Okay? Based on this fact, I can propose a exactness matrix. So I propose that there is a fundamental particle whose exactness matrix is given by this, with two simple poles relative to these bound states. Now, when I have this, uh, how to compute the remaining one? So this, uh, now I come back to the original question of the bootstrap. So the, the rule of the game is you pose an an educated guess what the dynamic is on the basis of some data, and then you elaborate on this so-called bootstrap system, which means uh, that uh, uh, 
you make it mathematical, uh, this statement, I think, of Orwell, all particles are equal, but one is more equal than the other. So there is a fundamental one that you use as building block. And when uh, you had this, once again, you impose that the S matrix of the bound state can be obtained in terms of the S matrix of the external particle. This creates a recursive structure in the amplitude, and you can close it. So you have to find, and we found, 28 amplitudes which concern with uh, S and T channel of the S matrix, satisfy therefore unitarity and crossing, which are this kind of uh, relation of these matrices, and moreover, as a pole structure, a bound states that you can extract immediately from the pole of these matrices. So once you, have, once you have this, the masses has to satisfy uh, uh, the, the famous Carnot relation of a triangle. So each bound state should be a site of a triangle whose external angle is precise the resonance angle of the S matrix. Okay? So with, this, uh, with these tools, a, a bit of patience, because there are a lot of particles around, you close the bootstrap and you find that there are seven particles in these cases whose mass ratio is given exactly here. And uh, once again, you can associate it to the Dinkin diagram of V7. And once again, you noticed that there are, in this case, three of them which are above threshold. Okay. Did you arrive at 28 amplitudes? Uh, because uh, seven times six plus seven. I divide by two, of course. <laughs> uh, okay, if you're not convinced, you have just to look at the dimension of these triangular matrices. Because you can collect all the information. So, for instance, in the channel A1, A1, I can see which are the bound states which appear. Okay? So, even and odd are the even and odd channels of this uh, system. So you can keep track of everything, of this, the masses, the bound state, the residue, whatever. Everything is exact. So here there are uh, the particles in high temperature. In low temperature, you expect to have kings. So there is the interesting question, what are the kings? Who are the kings? Well, the kings are just the odd particles. So here are a kind of uh, uh, table which tell us the parity and the nature of the particle. So in low temperature, the lowest is a kink and so on and so forth. Now, you might say, fantastic, but it might be completely off. It might be completely dream. It might be completely theoretical insanity. Can you really check the goodness of what you are doing? Yes, I can. There is a very efficient numerical method, which is called the truncated conformal space approach, will allow me to diagonalize numerically the quantum Hamiltonian and check the spectrum. And if I found the spectrum I'm predicting, it's okay. How to do it? Well, you take as uh, Hamiltonian the conformal Hamiltonian perturbed by the operator, which in this case here is the temperature. Now, in the conformal basis, the conformal Hamiltonian is particularly simple, it's diagonal, with a, a dependence of the radius of the cylinder where you are defining the theory given by the conformal dimension and central charge. On the other hand, the perturbation is given in terms of the structure calls that I computed at the very beginning. And it's kind of a field matrices. So when you do this, you diagonalize it, and of course, boundary condition make a role. So if you choose periodic boundary condition, you are going to not see kings of fermions, but only bound state of them. And uh, while kings of fermions exist with other kind of boundary conditions, and uh, the theory tells us that uh, if uh, the radius of the cylinder is much smaller than the correlation length, you should have a behavior 1 over r. But it's much larger, you should see the mass gap directly. So when you do this for the model, in high temperature, look what I found. So this is a spectrum of line versus R. And you see immediately that there are the lowest particle, which is one. 
precise what I, then the other 1.28, 1.87, 1.96, exactly what predicted by the scattering theory. This is high temperature. If I change temperature, what happened? I should have two vacua, which however, a finite volume, there are tunneling between them. Tunneling uh, mutated by kings. So you see there are exponential decay of all the odd lines. And the even one has remained completely untouched. <coughs> completely untouched. So this uh, data confirm completed the theory. Not only, but I can use also this uh, energy level to compute this matrix directly through better answers and numerical calculations. The, 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 these pictures show blue lines and red lines. Yeah. What, is, uh, what, what do they represent? They uh, are coming from the even and odd part of the spectrum. Because this theory has this Z2 symmetry which allowed me to organize even and odd. So this is, uh, I, I, I use the, sorry, I use the, okay, it doesn't come. I use the red because when I turn the temperature, only the odd ones move. The even is, is completely untouched. So, so what is the significance that at large R, these two lines come together? It's very clear. Because uh, you remember uh, you are uh, at finite volume R. Okay? And then you have uh, this is your landscape. So the barrier here is proportional to R because this is point wise in the, in the, in the cylinder. So the, the, the difference of energy between the levels has to be related to the tunneling, which is precise the mass of the kink. Uh, it, Precise come out like this. So if you make the exponential fit of this, you find exactly the same mass which I found if I go to the high temperature phase. So this is another interesting check of the theory. Okay. Okay. So all this uh, now I can use to go off shell and compute the correlation function. Why? I insert a complete set of states. I know now what states I'm talking about. I know their mass. And the only thing I have to do is essentially computed this uh, matrix element. So I can go to dynamical structure factor, which are those similar to experiments. And uh, the only thing remain to be computed is this one. So if I compute this quantity, I can compare directly with the experiments. So how to do it? So these are uh, all uh, uh, results coming from a recent paper with this, uh, my collaborator, uh, Cubero, Robert Koenig, uh, uh, Lenches, and uh, uh, Gabor Tagash. So four factors are these quantities. And uh, you can uh, depict like this, like an operator able to absorb particle out of the vacuum. And they satisfy what I used to call masochistic equation. What I mean masochistic is uh, you adapt a basis, let's say in states, and you have this kind of uh, operator either within or out. So I start with in, and then I insert a complete set of states out. Uh, of course, at this point, the in-out matrix element is the S matrix. But then I have an infinite number of terms. So I translated a very simple quantity into an infinite sum of other quantities. So for that reason, I call it masochistic. But then there is a logic behind the masochism. The logic is if the theory is integrable, this matrix is elastic. At this point, this infinite sum truncated exactly to the same number of terms but now related to <coughs> momentum which are negative. So this has convert the original equation into a Riemann-Hilbert problem. So I have to compute some quantity where I know the discontinuity, simply like that. And this can be done, this problem. So there are monodromy on this uh, particle associated to the S matrix. I want to point out that I know all the matrix element. Then uh, I uh, satisfy some recursive equation. So matrix element of certain number of particles is related to others with a very simple recursive equations. So for instance, if I take two particles, I put head to head, I annihilate to the vacuum. And so this go goes between n and n minus two, 
with a residue, which is given by here, depend on the S matrix, but also depend on non-local index, because in moving that, I have to pass through the operators. If the particle is not local with respect to the operator, acquire an extra phases. This is extremely important in the theory. So then you have also the bound state recursive equation, where this uh, gamma I know from the S matrix of uh, the residue of the S matrix. So to make the story short, you can complete this program exactly. You can compute this quantity exactly using what I described. It's just question how long you want to go. It's just question your patience. Why? Because the spectral series converge so fast that few terms are able to saturate them completely. Moreover, there is a very important observation. You probably have noticed that all equations I write it down for this uh, matrix element never refer to any operator, are completely general. So this uh, says something very important, that if I found all possible solutions of this equation, I should have a completely different way of uh, controlling the operator content. Namely, conformal field theory tells us uh, tools to identify fields. But this is a complete alternative, because any operator is associated to an infinite sequence of matrix elements. So if I found them all, I have another way of controlling it. So for the critical easy model, I found solving these equations, indeed, two z2 odd local solutions that I can easily identify in the sigma and the tricritical, the subleading term. I found two z2 even non-local solutions, which I can easily identify with the disorder parameters, and two z even local solutions, which are the epsilon and t. No more. There are no other solutions than that. Okay? How I can check that they are okay? Because I have some certain delta sum rule, which uh, I can evaluate in terms of form factor. Because if I insert here a complete set of states, this integral becomes a series of form factors. And then, if I notice that the series converge, let's say, to 380, well, this is the magnetic field. If it's converged 110, well, this is the energy operator, OK? OK, now, last point. I want to compare with experiments. But experiment as a lattice, as a microscopic structures. I've been wor working in the world of ideas, fields, theory, but I have to compare with the lattice fields. How shall I do it? Well, in this case, there is a subtlety. The subtlety is, uh, I have two magnetic fields to play with. So in general, the experimental fields um, people are talking about might be a linear combination of them. How to fix this constant? Well, this is very simple. Because uh, when uh, the experimentalist measure this, in terms of my quantities, we'll have uh, some theoretical quantities, sigma, sigma, theoretical sigma, sigma tilde, and so on and so forth. But there are two, co two, two constants to fix it. But remember, this amplitude has many, many poles. So it's sufficient to go two poles, fix it then, and I fix A and B. Once I've done, everything becomes deterministic. Okay? So in this case, I have two parameters to play with, not one. And so once you do this, you have these quantities, and uh, you can, uh, you can uh, you can uh, compute it then. So we compute it, this, these quantities, and we just uh, use it a certain number of fields, be, uh, particle, because I told you this series are very, very fast convergence. Notice there is, uh, is expected a very rich E7 spectroscopy. So you should have peak here, 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 then multiparticle, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and uh, let me just flash uh, some of these quantities. So the one particle for sigma sigma is given by this. And uh, the sigma sigma tilde is given by other uh, peak like this. And uh, you have all these quantities exact. So I just understand, so you have 
triggers positions of ticks, but the width, do we also have a trigger? So we have to cheat here a little bit. No, I mean, if you want to compare with experiments, so to, I expose the data cheating. To be honest, I mean, I, I plot it in such a way that the experimentalists can go easily there. Okay, so what is the cheating? The cheating is uh, you make broader this delta function. Yeah. Theoretically, it's a delta function. But for lattice effect, for uh, many things that the system is three-dimensional, not uh, strictly one-dimensional, you have a broadening of the resonances. And the rule of thumb is say you open these guys with a width which is the square root of the height, something like this. That is, is a experimental tricks. It's not mine. But you said why the no square of the height? I don't understand. Why? I mean, when the experimentalists fit a delta function, they open the delta function with uh, a width. Okay, with a width which is relative to the material they have, and the this is a disorder of coordination. No, no, no. It's it's, it's a really pure system. In that, I mean, isn't it the mega squared? So they should go no, wide. Yes. They go up. Honestly, as a theorist, I don't care how width, how large it is. So just I'm asking because you said there was no fit, and now it's no, no. There is no fit. No, 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 no. There is no fit. I mean, here I'm not compared with any experiment because there are no experiments whatsoever. Okay. There are no experiments whatsoever. I'm presenting the putative data okay. that I can give to an experimentalist with the rule E adopts. Okay. okay? Which is you broadening the resonance with a rule of how, how large is this. Personally, I don't care. I have a delta function where I can predict exactly the peak of this. These are exact numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay? I don't care. If you want, I can draw like a delta, delta function line. So, uh, the two-particle contribution, however, there is no such problem because you are integrating on and therefore you have the resonances at the threshold and some continuous line, resonance and continuous line and so on and so forth. Now you can do the same uh, story with the low temperature. You can uh, compute all the one-particle uh, contribution of it <coughs> is once again I have uh, exact data for all these resonances, exact. Forget about the broadening, I don't care. I'm talking about this, this guy here, like delta, and I know the... And then I can also compute all the two-particle contribution and so on, which give rise to a very specific curve, okay? So this is the challenge for the, for the experimentalist. I have all data to compare with, and I mean, possible if they are able to realize this class of universality, they should tell me you were right or you were wrong. So I discussed, so overall I discussed the physics of spin one, which displays with respect to the easy model, uh, more <coughs> remarkable symmetries. In particular, I discussed the A7, the supersymmetry, as well as the duality. The tricritical easy model is an ideal playground for this physics and is a theoretical gem in itself because you can check a lot of ideas popping up in other contexts here directly because you can solve everything. Therefore, quantum integrability, conformal field theory, form factor, and so on and so forth. The cell duality is related to interacting fermions and their zero modes. And there are detailed study of this E7 structure in terms of elastic S matrix, exact mass spectrum, form factor, and so on and so forth, which allows us to compute exactly the structure function, which display a very rich symmetry. And as I said, will be extremely fascinating to realize such class of universality experimentally, but so far is still an open challenge. Thank you. Yes, so you started by mentioning that the coincidence of the structure <coughs> constant for phi 1, 2 and phi 1, 3 was quite exceptional for the tricritical <coughs> model. And indeed, I think it's the only one where exactly this happens. <coughs> but if you go to the three state bus model, it can also be realized uh, using uh, extended CFT. And yes, so. it, in, in fact, it can, it can be done so in two different ways, either with W3 symmetry or using parafermions. Moreover, uh, instead of Z2, it has, it has S3 on the lattice. Uh, you can find on the lattice that it has quantum <coughs> S3. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, also yeah. found recently the, uh, recent, uh, recently that it has quantum G2 symmetry. So I was wondering, can a similar program, to what extent has a similar program been made for the three state part model? And <coughs> can you discover if so? Uh, can be done. Uh, I'm currently finishing one of the three critical pulse model. You might say, why the hell? Because it's E6. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the pulse model itself is simply S3. Fine, eh? perfectly fine. But uh, I would expect uh, you, I mean, if you carry out this, uh, this program, uh, you will arrive, I guess. Mass spectrum does not have a nice... Uh, a nice the, the Z3 uh, model itself, uh, if you, I mean, depending which perturbation you are uh, doing. If you do thermally, it's just a doublet of the generate mass, which are complex. I mean, are, uh, is a doublet of complex mass. So it's fine. I mean, absolutely fine. It's much simpler, as a matter of fact. All the equation I wrote down uh, assume a much uh, simpler form. So I would expect uh, you, you can carry out these, these things. I didn't do myself, but I don't see any obstruction for that. So. so in, in principle, there's a whole crossover scaling function that has both the tricritical behavior in and the critical behavior in it. But can you can you compute that I can. the whole function? I can. Not here, but I can. I can. I can show you. Yeah. So what you have to do is uh, rather than going uh, in temperature. You have to go in the density. However, there, the, the problem is extremely interesting from a theoretical point of view. Why? Because you have massless excitation. And to make it sense of massless S matrix is a, is a challenge because you have no, no gap. But can be done with the idea that you uh, consider S matrix as monodromy operator. So you do not assign much physical meaning to the S matrix as we are used to. It works, and when it works, I can compute the form factor massless. I did it, and I was able to follow exactly this flow, observing the correlation function as critical behavior with one power here and another one there. Yeah, I, I can show you the data. I can show you. Bernard, yes. Um, I have two questions. One is you stress this point that you now need a spin one easing. Um, but there are uh, there are other realizations of this tricritical easing point, like the, the hard square model, the anti-ferromagnetic easing model in a field. Yes. Uh, are they experimentally any easier? Or uh, you no. still have the same number of parameters. It is true. Uh, I've been discussed with a bunch of people, which is not an exhaustive list, not. Uh, so, uh, so far, nobody has really figured out how to really... For instance, there, you know that uh, uh, in a series of paper by Ian Affleck, he was able to show that starting from Majorana fermions and putting enough interaction, quartic interaction, you can climb back to the tricritical point. So he was able really to find a tricritical point and climbing back there. Beautiful. So you say, take uh, Majorana fermions or whatever realization, put interaction. But I'm not doing that because when I reach there, I have to open up. <laughs> And this, uh, even uh, Ian Affleck doesn't know how to do it. So I can arrive there a la Affleck, but how to go in the, the other direction become uh, tricky. I mean, if you have uh, any idea, welcome. <laughs> really welcome to you. The other question, uh, has this E7 structure been seen in solvable lattice models? Uh, Uh, look, I, I'm not an expert on these sides, but didn't Pasquier realize uh, lattice model with this symmetry? I, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong? I don't know. I'm, I, I'm so, the honest answer is I don't know. But we can easily check if something in the literature has been pursued along the line to display immediately this is seven symmetry. If they are one. restricted solid on solid yeah. models uh, with the, the pattern, the thinking pattern. Okay, so it can be seen, it can be seen. Okay, so Michele might have an answer, a better answer than me. 
Yeah. Did you want to ask a question, Michael? Well, in relation to the last two questions, uh, uh, this phenomenon of duplication in the spectrum, does this, is this accounted for by the self-duality of the model? Uh, what do you mean duplication on the spectrum? Well, coincidence of uh, dimensions. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this is the duality, indeed. The duality means uh, exactly that... In the case of the POTS model, also the anti-ferromagnetic... Uh, I, I would say so. Namely, you have... Uh, uh, two fields which are non-local, right, because this is the, the property of duality, and therefore at the critical point they should share the same uh, conformal dimension. And so, also constructs based on those, yeah. Yeah, so what I'm claiming is that an easier way, I'm not saying it's the only one, I mean, you'll get a much better way of uh, understanding in general this phenomena, but the easier way is to uh, see that the presence of fermions there and the zero mode of the fermion necessarily imply this structure. This is what I'm saying. I mean, it's a very simple argument why this model should display duality. Yeah. Yeah, so, so naively one would think that getting the form factors for E8 is actually harder than for E7, but somehow it took 20 years. Uh, to, so can you comment a bit? <laughs> <laughs> He's a professionalist. He's a professionalist. So, thanks for the question. Indeed, it looks odd, but there is a reason for that. You know what is the reason? The reason is, all the uh, technique was uh, worked out in the paper of E8. So, in that paper, we develop a lot of technique of form factor, like residue on higher pole, asymptotic behavior, blah, 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 blah. Now, what is the difficulty of E7? The difficulty is that there are more fields. So in E7, you have one odd and one even. And it's very easy to identify who is odd or who is even. Finished. But here, how the hell you identify two different odd and two different even fields, local, and two different even non-local. So this was the difficulty. It takes not 20, but reasonable amount of years, how to do it. And the trick was to enforce another equation that we call cluster equations. When the form factor you compute at very high energy, you should expect they clusterized, and you make an hypothesis what the matrix element are there. And when you do this, it works, and we can check through these uh, some rules. Thanks for the question, because this was indeed the reason for that. The problem was much more difficult. Much more difficult. Yeah. I think we should thank Giuseppe again for this.